Buongiorno. Good morning to you all. It's a uh, distinct pleasure to be among such a lovely group of far-right radicals. Uh, after all, according to much of the media, that is in fact what we are. We are a gathering of the world's leading antis. We are anti-gay, anti-abortion, anti-feminist. Even a prominent politician I'll leave unnamed here in Italy called this Congress a conference for right-wing losers. Where are they? <laughs> I certainly understand why they're so confident. Let's face it, everywhere we look today, it's as if the champions of secular liberalism are gaining another victory. Whether it's so-called same-sex marriage or the 50 different gender options on Facebook or lawsuits against Christian bakers, every day we are reminded that the world is changing in ways hitherto unimaginable. And yet, behind all the indignant insults and blustering banter, make no mistake, secular liberals are panicked. Over the last decade, we've seen winds of change that are politically and culturally transforming this world most especially here in Europe, in ways secular liberals never imagined in their worst nightmares. And so what I want to do for you this morning is introduce to you a field of scholarship that actually predicted these changes long before they occurred, which will in turn give us a window into what to expect for the future. It was several years ago I was doing research for my doctoral studies and I came across this field of scholarship that was called post-secular studies. And I have to admit, the term shocked me. Post-secular? How could that be when everywhere we look it looks like things are getting more secular, not post-secular? But there it was, scholar after scholar arguing that we are, in fact, entering into a post-secular age. Now, by post-secular, they mean very simply that our world is currently going through a massive religious renewal. Today, according to the World Values Survey, four out of five people in the world, that's 80% of the world's population, ascribe allegiance to one of the major historic world religions. In sub-Saharan Africa, Christianity is actually growing faster than the continent's population growth, suggesting massive conversions. In the Middle East, more Muslims are attending mosques than ever before. China is currently experiencing what may be the single greatest Christian revival in history. Hungary has declared its commitment to the revitalization of Christian civilization, all the while Poland has formally declared Jesus Christ as Lord and King over their nation. India is currently experiencing an extraordinary Hindu nationalist revival through the leadership of the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, which is the single largest democratic party in the world. In the Russian Federation, the Orthodox Church has risen to a prominence not seen since the days of the Tsars. And in Latin America, Pentecostalism is sweeping throughout the region all the while, more Catholics are attending Mass than ever before. It's no wonder that a number of scholars that have claimed that we are currently experiencing the single greatest religious surge the world has ever seen. Now, I'm reading this, and I couldn't help but think, that's not right. How can that be? How could religion be surging all the while it appeared that the world was becoming more and more secular? How can we be the future when so many consider us medieval? In a word, these two competing dynamics come together in something that we now commonly refer to as globalization. We all basically know what globalization is, at least intuitively, right? Coca-Cola, 
McDonald's, Disney, the International Monetary Fund, right? Have you ever noticed that all airline pilots sound the same? I, no matter where I fly, the same pilot follows me around. <laughs> really creepy. We're all living today with the same fast food chains, same internet search engines, same computer processors. This is globalization, this one size fits all political and economic system that basically turns the entire world into a giant version of Orlando, Florida. <laughs> but these post-secular scholars have long recognized that there is an inherent futility, uh, an eradicable weakness within globalization. You see, globalization is rooted in a philosophical commitment known as modernity. And modernity, simply put, is the enthronement of scientific rationalism as the one true way of understanding the world. A, a one-size-fits-all form of knowledge for all peoples, all times, all places. What post-secular scholars have recognized is that global populations simply don't believe this anymore. In fact, particularly here in the West, populations are being called postmodern, in that they've increasingly rejected modernity in favor of a plurality of cultural ways of knowing and being in the world. However, and here's the key, even though people in mass have rejected modernity, that hasn't stopped our Western elites our political, corporate, media elites from continuing to export modernity in the form of globalization. In other words, our elites are trying to export the fruit of modernity even though its roots have rotted out. But if populations have rejected a one-size-fits-all philosophical system, then inevitably those same populations are going to reject a one-size-fits-all political and economic system. And so what we are seeing today is a massive backlash going on all over the world against globalization, where populations are once again reasserting their nation's cultures, customs, traditions, most especially their religious traditions as mechanisms of resistance against the anti-cultural processes of globalization and its secular aristocracy. And this resi resistance, this religious renewal, is as global as globalism itself. So there you have our two competing dynamics. But this, of course, raises the question, is this it? Are we just going to see a perpetual clash between secular globalism and this reawakened traditionalist nationalism for the indefinite future? And the answer to that question is a resounding no. And that's because at the heart of this post-secular religious resurgence is nothing less than the revitalization of the natural family. Scholars such as Eric Kaufman over at the University of London are recognizing that we are, in fact, in the early stages of what he's calling a demographic revolution, a revolution where conservative religionists are on course, and these are his words, to take over the world. What scholars are noticing is that there's a dramatic, dramatic demographic difference between secularists and conservative religions. So, for example, in the United States, conservative evangelical women have a 30% fertility advantage over their secular counterparts. And this demographic deficit has dramatic effects over time. In a population evenly divided, okay, so it's 50%, it's say, conservative evangelical, 50%, you know, liberal secularist. With that 30% fertility differential, in one generation, that 50-50 split becomes 60-40. In two generations, it becomes 75-25. And in 10 generations, 200 years, it becomes 99-1.
This is the power of demographics. Already, demographers are estimating that there will be over 300 million Mormons in the United States by the end of the century. By the end of next century, there'll be over 300 million Amish. You know the Amish, right? The beards and wooden fireplaces. <laughs> So America is basically going to be evangelical Mormon and Amish. I know there's a joke in there somewhere, but I haven't figured it out yet. But it's not just the United States. Conservative religionists are flourishing quite literally everywhere. In France, 30% of the women are having over 50% of all births, and those women tend to be conservative Catholic women. Hungary, Poland, and Russia have implemented pro-family policies that are effectively reversing the respective fertility declines. And the Orthodox Church in Georgia has helped their nation go from having one of the lowest birth rates in Eastern Europe to now having one of the highest. Yeah, amen, right? Hey. By contrast, secularists consistently exemplify a low fertility rate of about 1.5 children per couple, which is significantly below the replacement level of 2.1. And as a consequence, starting around the year 2030, Kaufman and others are estimating that the secular population will begin a steady decline to no more than 10 to 14% of national populations. This is what's being called secularism's demographic contradiction. Their own devotion to radical individualism has become the agent by which their entire ideology implodes. But more than that, if the renewal of the family is at the heart of this religious resurgence, then that means this Congress, this World Congress of Families, stands at the very epicenter of that renewal. We are not right-wing losers. We are not medievalist throwbacks. We are the future. We are the future. We are a pro-life, pro-child, pro-family future. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, the secular world can do about that. And so behalf, on behalf of all this wonderful scholarship that kept me busy many, many hours in the library, I say to all of us, welcome to our new post-secular age. Grazie mille, thank you so much.